Remember to buy a copy of your favorite books from the Cheeky Merchant. If we don't have it, we'll source it for you, but we'll definitely find the book for you. Hi, Cheeky Natives. Welcome to another episode of the Cheeky Natives. I feel like this year, Little Honol and I have just been on a roll. We are bringing all of your faves questions for days and i think it's just been an amazing time and i know today is going to be one of those as well the clock- listen i'm doing well because it's always happy to see you and talk about our favorite things which is books i'm particularly excited about this conversation because i think that it's a long time coming but i think it's also important for kind of the moment that we're in so i'm really excited <laughs> but i'll give you again the honors right as the ceo of our our little baby yes um, girl bossing oh, yes <laughs> Sure. So I think it's the honor of introducing our authors today. I'm going to read their bios just so you know the kind of company that you're in today. So you know that the Cheeky Natives isn't playing with you in 2024. So I have the honor to introduce Lindsay Ebony Chisel, who is a Johannesburg based journalist and writer. She is a reporter with the New York Times, has worked for South African and international news outlets and has done stints in script writing for an international Emmy Awards nominated news satire show. Her short fiction has been shortlisted for the Afri Tondo Short Story Prize. Her reporting and storytelling are focused on gender, identity, culture, and politics in a changing South Africa and across the continent. She makes her own pasta and grows her own herbs, but is yet to keep an orchid alive. I feel seen. But the uh, herbs died too. I just, I had, I was gone on a, on a road trip. I came back and not a herb survived. I just don't understand. You know You're in great company because I have never kept an orchid alive. I need to update that bio. <laughs> Tessa Dooms is a director at the Rivonia Circle. She's a sociologist, a development practitioner, and a political analyst. Tessa has worked in diverse sectors, including government and the private sector, where she did work that aligns the objectives of various institutions and programs with developmental objectives for the advancements of Africa. She has um, 15 years experience as a development worker, a trainer and researcher with expertise on governance, youth development and innovation and has worked in over 10 African countries. In 2015, she was appointed to the National Planning Commission to advise the presidents on the implementation of South Africa's National Development Plan. She's a trustee of the Gahiso Trust and holds a Master of Arts degree from the University of the Witwatersrand, which is also my alma mater. (laughs) At least I'm not over the edge. (laughs) No, amen. I just made it. But they are the authors of Coloured, How Classification Became Culture. They are our guests on today's episode of The Cheeky Native. So welcome to you both. Thank you so much for joining us. That is a book for coloured people, by coloured people, and is a book of coloured and colourful stories from varied corners of the South African vista, past, present, and most importantly, the future. Welcome, (laughs) welcome our esteemed authors. I think it's really important To contextualize the conversation, I remember when there was a whole hoo-ha about Tyler and oh my gosh, what was happening? I was like, y'all got to recall it. Everybody's got to recall it. But I wanted to start there. The Tyler moment brought a very interesting eye in the way in which race is conceptualized globally. Tyler was unapologetic about saying she's colored and some Americans were bewildered that people were using the word colored. And they were like, oh my gosh, my sister, no, you can't use that word, our ancestors. And I wanted to start our conversation there. When that moment happened, right, as people who had already published the book, what went through your minds when you were seeing this kind of race play happening out? Yeah, so... It, it was really serendipitous, actually, mm-hmm. that the two moments collided. This, the book wasn't even out a month yet when Tyler started trending. And I'm answering this question because I got TikTok famous that week. <laughs> For the first time, I trended on TikTok because I inserted myself in that conversation. And in fact, what was interesting, the book wasn't out for a long time, but people were tagging me in that conversation and saying exactly what you're saying, that actually this book helps us have this conversation better. Because for me, it threw up exactly the reason why we wrote the book. This deep misunderstanding of coloredness and colored communities, 
and also the hostility. And that hostility is not only about the US, right? So when we started writing the book in 2020, it was in response to a similar outcry in South Africa that was pushing up against coloredness. So a young man named Nathaniel, Nathaniel Julius was murdered by the police in Aldo's. And it was around the same time that George Floyd had been murdered in the U.S. And Black Lives Matter was at a particular crescendo at the time. And instead of Black Lives Matter, our community in Aldo's had started Colored Lives Matter as a hashtag. And I remember the pushback we got even then. Why are you still using this word? Why are you using a word that was created by racists? Why are you still holding on to the past by using this word? And for me, it it brings up two things about coloredness. One is that coloredness has been stuck at the classification. The word colored only is seen and thought of in people's minds as a classification, as a racial word that comes with racism. And there's nothing else, right? We don't see colored people and colored communities as complex and multidimensional and layered. And with deep history and experiences, we just see And we are just seen as a classification as a people. And it's upsetting and it's hurtful because I'm more than just the word for boot called me or the word that Cecil John Rhodes called people years ago. We we are more than that. And everybody needs to come to the question of what it means to be colored with a lot more grace. Because that was also what was absolutely lacking in both responses, empathy and grace. No grace for Tyler. It was immediately assumed that when Tyler said, I am colored, she was immediately assumed as being anti-Black or both. Mm -hmm. Tyler has actually never said she's not Black, which is for me one of the most fascinating things. But just by virtue of saying she's colored, she's assumed to be saying she's not Black and she's anti-Black, which is just not an assumption that anyone should make. But for me, that was my instinctive thing, that really there's a misunderstanding, a lack of empathy. And Lindsay says this better than I do, but... It's that what are you thing again. And that's what colored people have been um, victims of, I think, in the post-democratic era, particularly. The question, what are you, which is such a diminishing question. I think just uh, what I find fascinating about Tyler was, and it's something that Tess has taught me in the journey of this book, we, as we ended up writing, our personal interests dictated where we went. I love history and I've quite often looked at the past and been digging through archives, et cetera. But Tessa, because she works in youth work and is, feels so deeply passionate about South Africa's young people, she said something to me that always resonates with me. She says, for children who are born after apartheid, colored is not a classification that has been given to them by an apartheid official or some sort of bureaucrat. It is a classification that is given to them by their communities and by their parents and their family. And what I find, and that always just stays so deeply with me because when I listen to young people like Tyler, when I listen to people like my nieces and nephews and your nieces and nephews, just the idea that this has been passed on to them. And so then the question is, of what has been passed on to them? And a culture has been passed on, a history has been passed on. And something that is to be proud of, because that's the difficult thing about being colored also, is that for so long we were being faced with this idea that you guys have no culture. You guys have no identity. You don't know where you're coming from. And there's just this lack of it. And there is, yes, we hide it quite well with humor, but there has at times been a point of shame. And there has been, but where do we belong? And you hear it as a journalist, I'm moving through the country and I'm talking to people and I keep hearing, particularly from colored, young colored kids saying, nobody sees us, nobody cares. And so when a young person like Tyler gets up on stage and says, oh, heck, <laughs> what the heck? And also, if you're oh, where? And I'm like, uh, yes, yes. Oh. And if, if you're from KZN or parts of Eastern Cape, the way she said, yeah, I was like, that's it. There we, there we are. Yeah. And so just that. And, and it was such, it, it's so affirming. And it, I see it when my nieces do the dance. It's such an affirming thing. And so I think, so yeah, it's just been a beautiful moment. We're taking a short break. We're taking a short break. So I guess I like 
uh, the comments around future making is an important one. I guess we'll go into it a little bit later. But in writing the book, you're asking people to reckon with a history of pain, of displacement, and subjugation that comes with coloredness, right? And it's a difficult history. There is the great trick, there is slavery, there's so much that happens in this history. And so I'm thinking about how you envision that people in their reckoning also begin to celebrate what is ultimately a really difficult history and a hard history as well. That what does that celebration look like? So how do we ask and how do we expect people to celebrate and look to the future in the context that they find themselves in? Yeah. We came to that answer very late in writing the book, to be fair. One of the moments I always reflect back on is the first time Lindsay and I had the full draft and we sat down and spoke about the full draft was the first time we realized how much pain was in the book. I think in writing it and as we were writing it, you're writing the pain, but you're not necessarily reflecting on it. And of course, you also haven't seen the other side. You haven't seen the other person's contribution. And when we saw the sum total of pain, that the collection of stories, because we tell the stories of different colored people, bring together, we were in tears. And one of the things that our publisher then encouraged us to do, she asked, what is the arc of the story, as you're saying, into the future? How, how do we move beyond? And that's how we started talking about what we call the reclamation arc of the book. And that's probably best shown through my father's story that starts the book and ends the book. So my father, who I've known, always known as Elliot Dooms, is a now 82-year-old man. But when I started writing the book, he was the first story that I went to. And my father telling his story about how he became classified as colored, especially because he was raised in a area among the Basutu people, not Basutu, I'm saying Basutu, Botswana, mm-hmm. my apologies. And he was Botswana speaking. I was like, how did you end up being classified colored? And his story is a story of a very violent classification. So he ends up as a 16-year-old coming from school to a classification office. He is then classified based on how he presents. He's a dark-skinned man. His name was a Tswana name. And he presented as he presented and was classified native. He then goes home, tells his family he's been classified, and the elders tell him, our family has decided to classify colored. And that's already one of the the problems in this history is families having to make decisions to classify colored as part of a stratification of blackness to divide and conquer. That's really what it was. It was such a divide and conquer in real time. And families had to opt in and out of that, right? I was thinking about it the other day as well, because one of my cousins, her surname is Oliphant. And somebody had misspelled it as Oliphant would normally be spelled with an F in Afrikaans. But the Oliphant as a surname is spelled PH because it's a made up surname. It's a made up surname when families were moving from being in Globus to presenting with a different kind of name, version of their name to be able to become colored. And so my father did a similar thing where he had to go back to be reclassified and presented speaking English and presented with an English name. And all of a sudden, Le Sole ceased to exist and Elliot was made. The horror for me was I never knew my father's name was Le Sole until he was 79 years old. Mm. That's how damaging apartheid was. That's how mm. violent it was. Mm. And... My father then, I think, triggered by our conversations and this book, decided to take us to the village where he was raised, a village that was decimated, that was given, the land was given to white people as part of the apartheid and land disposition project. And my father has this moment where he takes us back to the village he was raised and the town that he was in. And he says, I am now Lisole again. And he starts using that name and he takes us to this piece of land, which we find because the white farmer's house that he lived next to was still there, even though everything else was destroyed. Mm -hmm. But my father decided to reclaim and not reclaim the word colored or reclaim the history, but reclaim his right to identify himself, Mm -hmm. reclaim his right and his agency 
to give himself identity and to give himself name and to give himself his ability to belong in the world. And that's what we hope colored people get from this book, that we have the right to claim our history, our identity, and to name ourselves. So when people say, why are you still using the word colored? The word colored for me means something different from what you imagine it means in your mind. The word colored for me, even as somebody who was born during apartheid, meant my culture always. I was never, when I say colored, I was never describing some classification on a box. I was always describing my community. And I want the right to be able to say that without shame. I want the right to be able to say that with context. But also the Tyler generation and generations afterwards should be able to say, oh, we like the word colored, but we're going to give it a different context and meaning. And it's going to show up differently. Or we don't want the word colored. We want to name ourselves otherwise. What is important about the future is we have the right and race relations and undoing racism is about a project of re-taking back our power to name ourselves. It was what the Black consciousness movement was about as well. It was reclaiming the word and repurposing the word Black to mean something else, to mean that we are conscious, we're taking up the fight against white supremacy, we are turning it into something else. And that's what I hope this sparks for us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's say quickly, on the point of pain, so often when kind of people speak, there is a sense of social orphanhood and a sense of deep rejection by South Africa and deep rejection by South Africans and each other. This is the people who were moved from their land as San and Kore. They are people who were the products of a relationship, sometimes out of love, but often out of exploitation. And then that comes with rejection. Even up until well into the late 80s or the uh, mid 80s, there were children in KZN who were left in fields or abandoned in orphanages because they were too light-skinned. And so those are the people who are now seen as colored people, right? And so there's the sense of orphanhood and a sense of rejection. And what we're hoping when people read the book, and that's how we say it's for colored people also, is that you begin to see yourself as part of the, the greater South African story. You see yourself as the, this, the project that we know as South Africa now, which much to our anger, started when the Dutch arrived, because then that's when we were forced to create this sort of republic idea, and it's an adversarial idea. The idea that colored people were there from the beginning and continue to be to this day. They were part of the Great Trek. They were part of, there was enslavement. There was colonial battles in Kozulu Natal in the Eastern Cape. People, quite, colored people have been there the entire time. And even in that pain, I want people to face that pain because I want them to see that they are part of the pain, the blood that has watered the soil of this country. They have been here all the time. And that idea of being rejected, that sense of orphanhood and being left behind, I hope that is something that no longer defines being colored. Lindsay, we don't want to cry so early in the morning. Um, there, are fun things, there are fun things in the book too. In my study, I'm like, where did I put those tissues? Because, wow. <laughs> we will get to the fun things, definitely. <laughs> We need to talk about the wholeness and the fantastic wonderfulness in the book. Tessa said something really interesting about like kind of coloredness has always been linked to classification, right? In a way that I think is interesting about blackness and whiteness, right? Because they come from the same classification, but people proudly claim the identity of being black, right? And being white rather than being colored, right? And we're seeing in this whole like moment with Tyler that like they are like we are black honey right but you're like yeah but it was also from classification right shouldn't it also has a particular history but we're seeing this particular otherness as different from blackness and whiteness which i find always interesting i think you make a really important distinction in the book which i really appreciate right because oftentimes people think of colored as like a a black and white situation right and you talk about the story of Trevor Noah and you talk about this idea of like kind of race versus culture and you straight out say Trevor Noah is not colored. And he doesn't claim himself to be colored, right? But people Anymore. have come up with people <laughs> as colored. I wanted to speak a little bit about that. Like why was it important for you to make this kind of distinction about essentially mixed race people, uh, a, a particular identity 
and coloredness, right? While cultural classification is a particular cultural context, right? So I often term coloredness in a way as ethnically, it's an ethnicity, right? So we speak about just as the way as Sitswananess is an ethnicity, it's also an ethnicity. And it's beautiful because it's like kind of classification, but as you say, it became culture. So I wanted to just speak a little bit about that, right? Like just the troublings of waters around like the idea of race, right? And the idea of culture. So Jamal Khan, actually, who wrote the foreword, the brilliant Jamal Khan, made this point in a panel we had after the book, where he reminds us all that all racial categories or things that we conceive of a race were invented by white supremacy and the racist project of colonialism and slavery. And so when you say the words white or the words black, all of those things didn't exist by themselves naturally. They were a product of white people needing a justification for someone to oppress and figuring out that they were going to use skin tone as this invented reason why some people are more superior than others. That's it. And as you rightfully say, there's this embrace of the other terms as if they're not problematic. Mm. Race is problematic. As a concept, it's problematic. The biology and the idea that biology is destiny is problematic because that's what race um, is based on. And so we try to problematize coloredness in that context um, and the idea of colored as race in that context by looking at the story of Trevor Noah. Um, and, and maybe before I go to that part, it, it also links to what I said earlier about black consciousness, right? The reason why we embrace the word black in this moment is because black consciousness happened and we were given a new way to think of ourselves as black. But interestingly, the word black is not used as a racial category during apartheid or even today. Mm. So if you go to a four that says race, black does not appear on that list. It will say African. It will say African. During apartheid, it said native. The reason why that is, is because the white people know that everybody that's not white in their mind is black. And so all the categorizations are, are versions of black according to whiteness. <laughs> And therefore, we are Black as colored people. We are Black. And we, in a Black consciousness sense, must own that so that we participate in the struggles against racism and white supremacy, knowing that we are Black, that there's nothing in between. But so for Trevor Noah, right? Why is Trevor Noah, his book is called Born a Crime. Why is Trevor Noah born a crime? He's literally born a crime because he is evidence that white people desire black people. <laughs> that regardless of how inferior and not human and not worthwhile and not smart black people are, somehow white people desire black people. And whether that desire shows itself up in violence of rape or in love, that these babies that are conceived from these mixed relations are evidence that white supremacy is a lie, that there's nothing superior about white people over black people. And that's part of the reason why there's this resistance to intermarriage. People were like, oh, no, you want to keep it pure. You want to keep... No, you're trying to say we cannot be seen to like these people or want these people or see value in these people to the point that we are procreating and filling the earth with them. And they produce these beautiful babies. We can't have it happen. Because it rejects the lies of racism. Mm -hmm. And that's important for me as a starting point because a lot of colored people especially people who come from mixed descent, like I do, like Lindsay does, we are also part of those categories of people. So I am of mixed descent, as Trevor Noah is in certain ways. But I am colored and Trevor Noah is not because I was raised in a community that gave me a set of cultural ideas and experiences that is colored. He is somebody who's of mixed descent and also fits into a category that shows up racism and has been used by the system, but in different ways. I spoke earlier about people opting in and the changing of surnames in order to present 
uh, a particular way to be classified as colored. That in itself also shows you that the apartheid government and the white supremacists and the racists themselves know that race is not about biology. Because my father didn't change anything about his biology when he went back and got reclassified. He changed cultural traits. He changed his name. He changed his language. He changed how he presented himself. And all of a sudden, he wasn't Black or he wasn't Native. He was now colored. They knew then it wasn't race. They knew then that it was actually culture that they had to create because there was no thing that definitively distinguished people and said this person is native and this person is there was nothing that could actually do that work in its totality and so it was always been about culture and what we try to point out is especially past the apartheid moment which is the last legitimizing legalizing of the category because after that we're just now responding to it we have now because of the group areas act in particular been thrown together and told you are now colored people and in response to that in the last 70 years, we've learned how to live together and form common ways of doing things, common norms, common values, common culture. And that is now the contents of coloredness. So you can have the mixedness, but not everybody who's in the colored communities of mixed origin. Some people are Nama and Khoi and San, and there's no mixed anything. They're just from that lineage. Other people are Cape Malay. Other people are, are from slave ancestry. There's no mixed anything. The most mixed thing about colored communities is the fact that we are a mixture of different people with different ways of becoming colored. That's as mixed as we get, to be honest. Right? That <laughs> and so that's why it's important for us to point out that it is being in a colored community that's made us colored, not the classification and not race and biology. That's not a thing at all. We can debate even whether race is real, but definitely it's not the basis of coloredness. So I want us to touch on something that we spoke about earlier, which makes me very hopeful. And we've spoken about the reclamation arc, right? And we've spoken about history and, and agency for self-identification. But I'm interested about the colored place in the South African story, because we've spoken about Tyler and you've had conversations with the young colored people in our communities about the place of young people in this reclamation arc, particularly for future making as you think about the frontiers of coloredness, right? What would the place of young people in this reclamation arc look like? And what is your hope for young people in that reclamation arc? Now you take this for young people. Well, <laughs> young people need a pioneer, right? They always need to pioneer. So I'm a big believer that, especially in a country like ours, where the majority of people are youth, that those young people must be able to not only have a voice, but also be able to lead. And so I do think young people must pioneer. And I think that young people need to not be saddled with the baggage of their parents and their parents in that effort. So yes. We've come across many people, especially of older generations, liberation struggle generation particularly, who are harmed by the word colored. And rightfully, colored was a violent imposition on their lives and something that ripped apart their lives, their families and their cultures and their histories. However, to then say future generations can't use the word colored because it harmed me is not fair on young people who've not been harmed by the word in the same way. So I think we need to give young people the freedom to remake coloredness and what it means for them without the judgment. Because also there's this whole judgment of, if you don't know, you're ignorant of your history and you're ignorant of the past. No, I'm not ignorant of the past and the history. I'm just very cognizant of my present reality and what I'm doing. And what I'm doing is different from what they did. So I think young people must not be saddled with um, the pain and the history of the past as their reality. They must be cognizant of it. They must know it. But they must be given the freedom to remake colored identity in whichever wonderful ways they want to. In the book, there are a number of stories of young people doing that, especially in the music space. There are some young musicians who talk about rethinking the whole thing and bringing in elements of our culture into music that's contemporary. And again, Tyler is such a really good way of just thinking about it viscerally. Here, Tyler is creating a new genre almost, like a 
I'm a piano meets R&B meets hip hop meets Afro beats genre. And it's not even something that the colored community, it's not the history of the colored community alone that's in there. The R&B part is definitely part of the colored community's history in terms of our love for music and jazz, <laughs> all of it. But it's not that alone. She's like showing that there's a different version of coloredness that can be there. I was saying to Lindsay the other day, I'm so excited when Tyler wears her hair curly because in the colorism of colored community, she's the kind of girl who could have stick straight hair every day and be seen as much prettier because she has stick straight hair. And she's choosing cornrows and big bushy curls. And that gives a new dimension to what it can look like and be like to be colored. So that's the kind of stuff I'm excited about. I want to talk about the, the more joyful parts of the book. I love what you do in the book, right? And I want to start with Hey Scores, right? Identity on a Plate. Because I am, um, I, I will tell you, because I've been so excited about this conversation, I dreamt last night that we were like all sitting together and we were making hoodies and we were making like, oh, we just making food. Done. And while we were like uh, talking about this uh, conversation, I want to talk a little about that, right? Because food, I believe in, and I'm going to use this word deliberately, right? In Black communities, it's culture. The way in which we commune, the way in which we find ourselves is that we find ourselves in food. Food is history. Food is also memory. But food, food is also the future, right? In the book and in parts of the book where you write about hay schools, you take us on a journey, right? To tell us, firstly, that coloredness is not monolithic, right? So when you think about Cape Malay colors, for instance, and you think about Durban colors, and you think about colors that grew up in the Northern Cape, and you think about colors that grew up in El Dorado Park, you are going to go to all those houses and experience a different form of coloredness, right? I often think about, for a number of years, I haven't been able to participate in the pickle fish tradition, but I, I always am excited about Easter time because I know it's a whole pickle fish tradition and we know who is the one that makes the best pickle fish, right? And we want to... <laughs> pickle <laughs> fish and hot cross bun. Why are you yeah. erasing hot cross buns from the conversation? Yes, I can't erase hot cross buns. <laughs> I, I, I want to speak about his course, right? Identity on a plate and speak about the makings of, of food as an integral part of this culture, of, of this blackness that effectively we know that some of the food that we've made has been as a result of history, as a result of the back date, but we've reclaimed that. And it's not delicacies, it's not like uh, poverty food, but it's actually culture. It's who we are. So I want to talk a little bit about hey, schools, the, uh just food and, and the fullness of, 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 of culture. Oh, we should have. We should have gotten together and gotten Cook Sisters. And we could have sat here and t- partaken in that centuries old tradition of plating a cook sister so i think high school was and for me in particular and for I don't think any family who you are is in your recipe book for us it's written down in an old a4 charter in my in and kept in the family drawer but that is a history of who we are and how we got to where we are and i think culture and an ethnicity that has had to make itself and rebuild itself out of pain and out of hardship and out of exploitation and rejection. The ingredients of certain foods bring about that idea of how we are able to build ourselves up and to take ourselves back. And it's not unlike the African-American experience also in terms of how the food that has become known as Southern cooking, the food that has been embraced as the American identity, mac and cheese, for example, chitlins, those are foods of people who had no other choice and used the scraps that were falling off the table to feed Mm -hmm. their families and turn that into something that is not just nutritious, but also loving and Mm -hmm. and holds a part of their mother's hand and their father's history in that food. And that's what food means for me in particular. Oh, I always joke, I am never going to be thin. (laughs) Because cooking is such an important part of me. And I think what I've learned in, in, in the writing of this book was the importance of the cook sister. And when I say the importance of the cook sister, I really need for people to understand. I'm not talking about this, the hard shell. Screw up cookie. Pale skinned. That's not what I love. Because that's not a cook sister. 
So, so kind of people will say sisters, the accent up in the West is a bit harder, but then the East of the country, Joburg is a bit harder. So my family is always say sister. But yeah, what it is, a sister or a bola down here in Cape Town has a different version of it. It's a version of a food that was, and I, because we have no history, we don't know where it comes from. So I imagine that there must have been this, this enslaved woman who was working in a Dutch kitchen and her master told her to make oli bollen, which is a Dutch donut. And she then had to make, and she made her own version. And she took the spices of her home, right? She took cardamom and nutmeg and coconut. Spices that they were trading. This is the thing, right? The Dutch were not just trading spices, they were trading people along with those spices. These spices were also incredibly expensive. We take for granted now that you can just go and buy cinnamon. Cinnamon was incredibly expensive. So I also think of the revolutionary act of stealing cinnamon and putting it together and making this cook sister that feels like something like home. Or slave. And there's a place here in Cape Town, which used to be the slave tree. There's a monument there. And you forget when you're walking through Cape Town CBD that people were sold here. And there was a man who for years used to sell cook sisters under that tree where it used to be. And I think that coming together, that history, that idea that in this pain, we have found something warm and sweet and comforting. It's just, it's, it, for me, it's such a triumph, it's such a reclamation in that little piece of warm dough to take something of your slave master, to steal and to make something of your own. And what also, it also tells me is that there's a commonality in being colored because we, we, we don't, obviously we have not spoken enough because we joke. People in the Cape think that people up in Joburg don't eat cook sisters. We do, in fact. On a Sunday morning, you're selling out of the boot in church. <laughs> everybody knows everybody put an order in the sisters' owns when you come get your order. That, that's it. A sense of community has also formed around this. And when you move to the suburbs, you're like, where do I find cook sisters? I have driven. I drive because that is what tastes like home to me. <laughs> It's also why there's a certain bakery in Northern Joburg that was our cook sisters about 80 rand a dozen. Because <laughs> that's not how much it's going to be. plug me. It's so expensive. Because they know that we are going to find this. And I think, and that is for me what is beautiful about it. There's a, there's a shared experience. But then we also know that, because I phoned around and I asked friends, hey, have you eaten Baboti? Because Baboti is controversial. And I'm like, yo, I have never eaten Baboti in my life. And I asked a friend who grew up in the Northern Cape, I said, listen, have you ever eaten, did your family eat Baboti? Is it just us? And she was like, I have never eaten Baboti in my life. <laughs> and so this thing that is seen as such a deeply colored food is also a very Cape Townian thing. And then it reminds us that there are many different ways of being colored. We find, for example, there was a family in Durban that I found whose family was from Bali and they had reinvented a, a dish with spaghetti and that's how they kept their grandmother's history. And I think that's how food matters so much to me because I think it's who you are. It is your history. It is your family's story all on a plate, whether it is seven colors Sunday or the thing that I went back to after many years, which is to cook dal, lentil curry. And just to think about how the Gatsby came about because of the Group Areas Act and because Mr. Pandey and his family were being moved and they had to figure out what they were going to eat. And they threw the sandwich together and it becomes the Gatsby. And it becomes this thing that defines an urban colored culture that's reclaiming and remaking and using what you have to not only feed yourself, but to make of yourself. I think that for me is something that just, I could talk about food all day. <laughs> We've, we've spoken a little bit about it, and I think it's great because it segues into it, but there's been a lot of, I guess, in the book, a lot about contemporary culture and really what it means to form your own culture, right? Particularly around hair. Hair is always going to be topical. Hair is always going to be an interesting conversation for me. Um, and I've actually been forced to think about hair a lot because I realize I always have my hair in braids or something and my 17 month old saw my afro for the first time and my child was so intrigued i was just like this is an indictment on me as a parent because my child cannot be so intrigued by seeing an afro and we think we're over all of the hair things we think we're over the relaxer we're over the blow dryer and then you have 
protective styles, but is it really protective? Who are you protecting? What are you protecting? And you're forced to reckon with yourself, right? You're really forced to reckon with yourself because why is my child so surprised to see what my natural hair looks like? I loved that you spoke about hair in this book, not only hair as a source of pain, but really hair as a way in which people form their own culture and get to rethink contemporary culture. And I wanted us to speak a little bit about the shift in hair, right? Because we were talking about the other day, my hair size was saying, oh yeah, she actually doesn't have people relaxing their hair anymore. It's just, it's like really not a thing. And I was shocked, right? Because when I was a teenager, everyone was relaxing their hair. So that is probably one of my favorite parts of this book is when you speak about hair and just contemporary attitudes towards hair, but also the throwbacks to the ways in which our hair and our parents traumatized us with relaxer oh and the like. But I also want to add just a dimension. I also think the conversation about hair is interesting because it also brings about this discussion about community because mm -hmm. like hair, particularly as we understand it in black communities, when we were younger, so we were put between thighs and, and all of that. But soon it became like a, a moment of reckoning. Let's think about Sunday morning or afternoon when you're getting ready for school. All of you would be set together and people would be like fixing up their hair for the week. There was also a number of gossiping. So there was also community and, and also mm. kind of friendship that was created there. And I wanted to speak a little bit about that, right? Just... The very traumatizing bits that we were subjected to, but also the ways in which those moments, even though we didn't think of it then as moments mm. of kinship, how they became moments of kinship. But with that being said, it would be remiss to also not speak about hair as classification. I say that because the book is titled How Classification Became Culture, but Tessa spoke to it earlier about how even just wearing your hair natural is a very particular political statement, particularly in our communities where we know that colorism, texturism, every other ism also manifests in our hair. Yeah. I want to start this one and then throw it to Lindsay just by linking it to the um, feminism chapter, actually, the feminist chapter. The chapter is called Gerg Sister of Stratmate. Stratmate, yes! For <laughs> so our international that, audience, they'll be like, oh, I also yeah. a black sister or a strap mate. There's two ways to show up as a colored woman. Either you are a church girl that's very respectable and meek and mild and submissive and gentle, or you are a street girl, a girl of the streets, loose and dangerous with <laughs> all the connotations that come with dangerous. And the hair stuff is actually part of what I call the respectability politics of coloredness, and especially for colored women. So to, to have your hair neat, to have your hair look a particular way is more respectable. And a lot of what colored people were doing as we were creating culture, were tr we were trying to find ways to be respectable, to be respected, to be legitimate, and a proximity to whiteness gave more respectability gave more value, gave more status. And so we, in our hair culture, we've equated being respectable and being pretty and being all sorts of things to having straight hair because it's closer to whiteness. But I wanted to make that connection to the femininity stuff because I don't think we speak enough about how colored, coloredness is about gangsterism and violence but coloredness is also about respectability and wanting to this desire to be accepted through respectability politics and I think hair is a big part of that mm. I don't think hair is you can't change what your skin tone looks like but you can change your hair tone right your hair texture and so that's where hair becomes this battleground and it becomes this battleground for striving to being as close as white as humanly possible. And this is how you also know that race is not only a construct. And you also understand the absurdity and the cruelty of the apartheid regime. It would decide where you worked, whether you worked in the front of the shop or the back of the shop. It would decide the kind of husband you got. Did you get a good husband? And would you give him babies with good hair? Or do you get somebody who's got a cruscope like you? And what is the fate of those poor children? 
Those are conversations that young colored people are making today. What will my child's hair look like if I stay with this boy? You know, that, that is a real, a very real thing. And it speaks to how much value was placed on hair and how much power it had in the community. And so a really easy way of understanding their power is to look at the color of your rollers, or what Americans call colors. If your colors were orange, that means they were big and your hair was long. If your colors were pink, it means your hair is short. If your hair can grow, it means you are closer to white. It means you have more value. It means you have more opportunities. If your hair can't grow, you are unfortunately closer to black. And this is where the anti-blackness comes in because so much effort and time was put into hiding your roots and any traces of who you were. Any trace of your blackness was straightened away, was pulled away, was ironed away. And we still do that, right? Because even when we do wear our hair natural, we have this awful tiering system of whether your hair is 3A or 4C, because we are still playing into white supremacy, even when we wear our afros. And when you were talking about protective styles, when you said, who's protective style? Precisely, right? Who's protective style? What, what am I protecting? What am I hiding? How am I moving through the world? And what even is an acceptable curl? And we need to understand the history of that acceptable curl and that idea of it. And so one of the, the big things to remember is that if you were going to be classified as colored, they looked at your hair. And so you walked in and they decided, okay, do you have good hair or do you have bad hair? I have an aunt where a bureaucrat literally put his fingers in her hair and felt it and then decided what she was going to be and what her son was going to be. And that then decides her entire fate and her destiny. And I think that is where he, and to be able to unlearn that has been a journey for us as a family. Because when, when I wrote in the book, I said, my cousin and I, we weren't allowed to, my family was a little black on we were BCM and black consciousness movement. Tell that to a 12-year-old who wants nothing but straight hair. I just want a straight hair. Because every woman that I saw on TV had straight hair. My mother, even though she banned me from wearing straight hair, wore her hair straight because she was a nurse. And in order to be a nurse, you had to look respectable. In order to be respectable, you had to be able to put your hair up in a bun. It defined my mother's opportunities as a student nurse. It defined my grandmother's opportunities as, as a cook and as a, as a maid. and for me, I, I also wanted to be an adult. But there's also, even with hair, there was a sense of almost promiscuity, a sense of like a precociousness. If your hair is straight, then you will know that you are pretty. Like Eve eating the apple. Then you will know that this is where your value is and, and that's what's so dangerous. And so when we do get into that journey of accepting and claiming our hair, what I wrote about was my niece, because now my cousin, who her and I struggled together with hair, she now has a daughter and it does not even occur to my niece that she might straighten her hair. She, the relaxer moment is not going to be a moment for her ever. We hope and pray. And when we went to a family wedding, which was always a big deal, she chose to wear braids and she wore the pink and blue braids. And it was such a joy. It was such a victorious moment. But at the same time, the thing that breaks my heart is one day someone did straighten her hair and they ironed it. And you could see that she felt more valued and more beautiful because her hair was ironed. And it made me think that, no, we've worked so hard to try and reinforce the fact that her hair is beautiful just as it is. But there are all these messages that we are still pushing up against. You know, not just the 4A, 3B situation, but just the idea that what exactly is beautiful among Blackness? What is acceptable among Blackness? And the idea that white supremacy still creates the tiering system of how we see ourselves, no matter how hard we've tried to break that. I, I wonder what it must be like for people with children. But how do you fight a system that is built to tell you that you are not good enough? It was done more overtly during the apartheid era, but now it is done so insidiously. And it's mm -hmm. using the tools, the very tools that we used to free ourselves the natural hair and the afro, it's using those tools against us with the new classifications. And I think that we must continue to guard against that. And I just think the story about hair is not over. Mm. Oh, great again, in this podcast, got to, we are in church. I wanted to speak about of men, manner, and more face, right? Uh, <laughs> I also, just, I want to talk about how brilliant, like, the titles of the chapters are. 
But I wanted to speak about contemporary masculinity, right? And contemporary masculinity within a, a particular type of culture, right? Because we think about all these really important conversations about thinking deeply about toxic masculinity, what does it mean, right? But we also have to think about a particularness of masculinity within a particular context and a particular culture, right? We think about the Nathaniel Julie's um, pivotal moment in the book and arc in the book, right? But it allows us to think more deeply about what it means to be men, mana, or to be outside of what is perceived to be masculine in a colored community. And I wanted to speak a little bit about that, right? Like in writing the book, obviously, you may have spoken to particular people who, when you were thinking about these ideas of masculinity, what are some of the reflections that you have and maybe even what was surprising in thinking about contemporary masculinity within a colored context? I will start by saying I struggled with this chapter back and forth. I think it was the very last chapter to come in because... And there were a couple of reasons. One was, who was I to talk for colored men? And I think that's a sense of imposter syndrome that every author has. Who am I to talk for this group of people? But then also to talk about what has been a difficult relationship within the colored community in the way in which gender has shaped our destinies, in which gender shapes our Sunday afternoons and the rest of my life. And so I had to reckon with my, my own anger, but also reckon with, and also come to a point of compassion and to really move to a point of love, to remind myself how much I love the men in my life, my grandfather, my brother, my uncles, my friends, the hairdresser who first did my hair, shout out to Sean in Old Aldous, you know. <laughs> and, and what it was is so there are a couple of things and what I, and the realization around it one was the easy thing to do here was to talk about gangsterism the easy thing to do was going to be and a couple of books on the, the numbers gangs and how that system plays out and how it is a recreation of a social structure that was created under apartheid and how that structure also informs how masculinity is expressed in terms of homosexuality and the idea of a wifey and how that then plays out outside. Because if you've been a wifey in prison, what is it? How are you a man then outside of prison, right? Because also there's a difficult relationship with homosexuality in the sense that where colored people are more accepting, they seem to be outwardly more accepting of so-called morphies. But then what it is, is that it's a caricature of what it means to be a gay man. And it is a painful caricature. So you're in the front of the troop, of the carnival troop, but then are you fully accepted for all your complexity? And those are the questions we've been asking when we've been having conversations with men after this. And then the other thing is, in that culture of gangsterism, that idea that homosexuality and that idea of femininity is used as a, a tool of subjugation. Mm-hmm. The manner in which you enforce the rules of gangsterism is to say that you are a woman is to feminize someone, is to feminize men. And so I think there's that difficulty that comes with that, right? But then there was something else that was happening. And as I was going through the, the research was, there was this real push by colored men to be seen as respectable. This real push to be seen that we are real men. We stand for ourselves. And what you see is that you've got things like the Boy Scouts coming, the Muslim Boy Scouts and the Christian Boy Scouts and sports. Sports plays an incredible role. As I write about the story of Ashwin Willems, who escapes gangsterism and hits the top of his career, rugby World Cups, he gets an MBA. He does everything he is supposed to. He wears a suit. Finally, he gets to be a respectable man. But then he is humiliated on television and he's reminded that he is nothing. And it is that replay of Apartheid's thousand little cuts that when I was talking to Cheryl Carolis about this book, we had gone in there thinking we were going to talk about the Black Consciousness Movement. And she started talking about her father's story. And I was like, oh, that's this. Where she talks about what a feminist of a father he was. What a girl dad. That strong woman is because he raised her. But then at the same time, he was abusive towards her mother. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, to stand up and provide for his family, the apartheid government continuously over and over tells him that he's not enough. A thousand little cuts every time to say that you as a man are not enough. And so when you are out in that world and you come back and you subjugate, 
your community and you subjugate your family to the same pain and trauma that you have experienced. That's why I said this was such a difficult chapter to write about. And so I was thinking about my grandfather who got up every day to go to work early and how my uncle fought with him who was an activist and said to him, you know, you're going to work for this white man. But then again, the thousand little cuts, like he must work, he must subjugate himself in order to feed his family. And so there's this complexity where it seems like colored men had a choice where you were either deeply respectable, you were a priest, an imam, a springbok captain, you were either on the sports field and you were brilliant, or you were a squally, you were a deep gangster, and you were the worst of the worst, you were the best of the best, and you were the worst of the worst. And if your masculinity did not fit into either one of those two, you were going to be a caricature, the so-called morphe. Like those are the, the three categories that you were forced into as a man in South Africa or a colored man. And so I just think it took an awful lot of compassion because what we do know is that those systems infiltrated our communities and they brought that pain back into our communities and into our homes and into our families. And so the question then for me is, and the question for men, and we were having this really interesting conversation with a student of Stellenbosch about a guy on the rugby team, a guy who was openly gay. He's like, how do we reclaim what it means to be colored men? How do we get to be our full selves and to show up not just as one extreme or the other? How do I not get to be your caricature for all colored people? It's like, how do we get to be our full selves? How do we no longer have this conversation of you are no longer the priest or you are no longer the gangster? You are no longer black enough or not, not black enough and you are no longer not white enough. You are simply enough as you are. I think that for me would be the big reclamation is if we are just beginning to accept that we are enough. Mm. Just in, in closing, we started this conversation and in the beginning you spoke about being ethnically colored and politically black and there was a distinction that was to be made there. But I'm also thinking around what it means, you know, just in, in reckoning what it means to have a recognition of a broad community, but also how to be in community with people that you may find that you're in competition with, right? And there's a very particular way that the apartheid government created the, the political hierarchy, the hierarchy of race, that also means that in many ways, colored people feel that they may be in competition with people that they should be in community and in solidarity with. And so I guess in closing, the question is, in the recognition of a broad community, how do we ask people to then be in community with those people that they sometimes feel they may be in competition with? The other day I was on Metro FM and we were having an all-coloured conversation. Uh, I think just about everybody in the room, about one person was coloured, which was very, very interesting. <laughs> the conversation really became about are Black people resentful and Black people as a broad category? resentful of colored people in particular or colored people resentful of black people and my response to that is every time we ask those questions we are playing into apartheid and everything it meant to do so when i said earlier that black wasn't a category on apartheid's list of races i want us to all remember that because what the apartheid list of races is it created internal racial divisions amongst Black people and put us in competition with each other for scraps. So when Black people say, Black communities in general say to colored communities that we're anti-Black when we claim our coloredness, um, it's actually an accusation. It's an accusation based on you're claiming that privilege that apartheid gave you. What we must remember is that privilege was scraps. That privilege was your street is a little bit wider. That privilege was you get to be in the front of the store, not the back of the store. But you weren't actually having a significantly better life. You didn't own the store. That privilege meant that my father couldn't teach me his language for fear that he would be removed from me. So the privilege we think that comes with being colored, especially during apartheid, and what people still think that privilege exists now, is really scraps invented by white supremacy. We must not fall into the trap of fighting for scraps. We must also not fall into the trap of oppression Olympics. And this is a problem that our community has. The colored community in this moment is in oppression Olympics to prove who's more oppressed. 
And there's no value in that in a country like ours, where there are so many of us who are equally oppressed by not only white supremacy now, but by capitalism, by political elites, by people who've taken over systems that they inherited from apartheid and didn't dismantle them. We must start looking at each other and finding our commonalities in our oppression, as opposed to trying to figure out who's more oppressed and less oppressed. The big conversation that we're having right now about the new employment equity laws is an oppression Olympics conversation that must end. Because we're not going to be fighting about who's more oppressed. We're going to tell the system of power and especially class differentiations and inequalities that we need to have equitable access to everything not mm-hmm. scraps that we are fighting for and that we have to prove that we are poor enough, black enough, or oppressed enough to get. And so that is that is really my hope for that part of the conversation. The secondary part of it is that we must think about what internalized anti-blackness has done to us, the ways in which it's damaged us as colored communities, our relationship with whiteness and our own blackness was set up to incentivize us to want to do away with our blackness and suppress our blackness and suppress our relationship with the black community and recognize that that was all done to disempower all of us, to weaken blackness politically. And so we must re-opt into our blackness in order to start creating a greater power base against oppressive systems. Mm. It's absolutely important. And then the last part is to re-emphasize something that Lindsay said earlier. And A lot of the conversations that we've been having since this book has come out has shown us the way in which we are taking up the role of the apartheid clerk by continually trying to figure out who belongs in which apartheid box. When we say and talk about the word colored, it is not our aim to keep apartheid alive or to make sure everybody finds themselves in the colored box. Or to, no, that's not the aim. The aim is actually to give new meaning to what it means to be colored and to show that despite what apartheid tried, we have created more than just a classification. And then we can move from that about the good parts of it and the bad parts of it. And I assure you, in this book, we cover both. We cover both the joys and we cover what some people have called the fail on a rocker <laughs> of our community the dirty petticoats of our community. (laughs) We are not trying to hide or or whitewash and just make everything pleasant within coloredness and everything. We've got our issues. We've got issues around racism. We've got issues around anti-Blackness. We've got issues around colorism and classism. All of those things are also part of the thing that we we do, but you cannot change things unless you can name them. You can't change things unless you can face them. And we're not going to change the history of this country by just pretending the terms don't exist, just pretending the word color doesn't exist anymore. When the DA talks about doing away with racial categories, as if that's magically going to undo racial tensions, they're delusional. You don't get rid of race by just not saying the words anymore. You have to intentionally undo apartheid in the same way apartheid was intentionally done. In 10 years span, the apartheid government created over 100 laws to cement apartheid. You think you're going to get rid of that by just taking words away? You're delusional. And that's why we're not moving forward, because we're systematically and intentionally trying to undo it. And that's, I think, where the magic lies. I think it would be remiss before we leave to speak about our way massacred. I think it would be remiss to speak about the ways in which coloredness again, in, in kind of the, the creation, is, is the making, right? Because often people make the assumption that all colored people speak Afrikaans, right? And also brush colored people with uh, an Afrikaansness and that. And then the second layer is also to think about the ways in which Afrikaans is interesting because Afrikaans is also about tonality. It's also about dialect. So when I encounter, for instance, like colored people in Cape Town, we speak a different dialect of Afrikaans than colored people in Namakaland or colored people in Uppington or colored people in Kimberley, for instance, right? And so I wanted to speak a little bit about that because I think it would be remiss to not speak about the ways in which coloredness allows us to be magicians of words, right? And to create our own kind of 
language, even though it is in a broader landscape of what we term Afrikaans. Mm. I mean, Afrikaans is one of those, and one another example of just how, A, that sense of rejection, but even when you are being rejected, you make your presence felt, and you are here, and I am seen respect even if you don't want to see me and also the very difficult internal strife of what it sometimes means to be colored because your entire identity was created by colonialism enslavement and apartheid and so now you've got to take this identity this terrible burden that's been given to you and you turn it into something beautiful so i think like the language that we know as afrikaans today it used to be dutch but it stopped being dutch when the little white babies of the colonialists started sounding like the black women who were raising them. And so what happens then is you have an enslaved community and a community of San and Koi who are no longer allowed to speak the languages of the Cape. And so then they come together and they speak this creolized version of Dutch and they add their own words, right? They add the word pisang, which is an Indonesian word for banana. They add a lilt and an accent to it. And then the children that they're raising start sounding like them. And also the poor whites start sounding like them because that's who you know. When this is the thing that we, the thing that unfortunately we overlook in South Africa is class because race takes up such a big part of untangling our country. We often overlook the role of a class struggle within the country. And so poor whites were put it right next door to colored people. They were just slightly better in certain communities, particularly around the Eastern Cape and the Western Cape. And so the Northern Cape. And so what happens is these poor whites are beginning to sound a little too close to the colors too. And so then there's this identity project and this is where white supremacy comes into play again because white supremacy has to come up with its own language and it has to make sure that it does not sound like the black and brown people that they live next door. They need to differentiate. And so this purification happens in the same way like a racial purification, a language purification project that goes on to. And so this idea that you are being rejected, right? Like you, how you speak is no longer acceptable. How you speak is not Afrikaans. This is Afrikaans. We own this language. I always say that for the years that Sievan Delan ran, I don't know any colored people who spoke to each other the way Vanessa and Charmaine spoke. (laughs) I just don't understand that. They are are probably in Uppington. No, no, that accent doesn't. (laughs) It was so... Not the Uppington slander. Not the Uppington slander (laughs) teams. Well, I feel like... It's interesting because no, it, it sounds like my Afrikaans, right? So uh, every time I speak Afrikaans, people are like, why do you sound so white? And I'm like, naturally, because I went to a white school. It's still in Baj. So, of course, yeah, they brought so, saving like, Afrikaans, right? And that's an important distinction to make, right? That, like, locality and where you are also influences how you sound, right? It's in the same way that... Your English doesn't sound the same depending on where you are, who you're speaking to. The English you and I speak to each other is not the English we speak at work. And to pretend that it does is to not understand our culture. But also the who you're speaking it to, right? Mm -hmm. And that's why it's important how Charmaine and Vanessa spoke to each other. I can understand Charmaine speaking to... uh, What is the name? Whatever. Hilda and Hilda. And Obas. Look at the fact that Obas. Obas, yes, Obas, yes, you're right. You're right. Exposing our age in this podcast. Charmaine speaking like that to Obas. Charmaine speaking like that to Vanessa. Nope. And this is where when Afrikaans lives inside your heart and it lives inside your tongue and inside your brain. And the idea that when you were going to be an anti-apartheid activist and you were going to be a student activist, particularly in the 70s when people were... Afrikaans was the galvanizing thing that pushed the 1976 riots. But then you, as a colored student activist, and this is when I was talking to Sheila Krolis as well, the idea that you are now going to mobilize communities against Afrikaans in Afrikaans, right? Because the thing that we forget also is, by the time the apartheid government was forcing Afrikaans as the first language into black schools, it had experimented with it in colored schools. And it had forced colored schools to teach a certain savor Afrikaans. And they would... and the first language Afrikaans education, when I started school in Aldera Park, there was only one English class for every three Afrikaans classes. Mm. Afrikaans was very much seen as a way in which a sense of subjugation and a way of homogenizing the colored experience. Mm. And so how do you then mobilize against a language that you have also created and a language that has been taken away from you? 
how do you reclaim your space in this language when we do not own the tools of production? The way in which a language is now kept alive is through literature, it is through television, it is through film. But colored filmmakers and colored authors are struggling to put versions of themselves on the screen and in books. They're struggling to put a version of themselves in which they get to speak in their accents and speak with who, as who they are, but also get to have full lives, right? It's kind of like they're only accessible if they're Model C colors. Yeah. <laughs> but then they're not even accessible, you know, the ones that... And, we're back at the that. Vanessa colors, but not Errol, for instance. Errol, like that. Yes. <laughs> and then, of course, you get, and again, it's the flattening of the black experience and the flattening of the colored experience because not everybody who is colored speaks Afrikaans. And it's again this idea that our identity was shaped by colonialism. So, in the East, in Kwasi, where my family is from, this is an English speaking province, and it is a province that doesn't have an accent in the way that Joburg and Cape Town has an accent. Tyler's accent is closer to, to KZN. So it's that soft T, it's the here, it's the we say did, we say y'all instead of use. We say window, not wind. And there's a favorite of mine. We hear Durban, I'd say there wa, instead of there, go there wa. <laughs> it's, just, it's an accent, it's like an entire, and it gets even it's worse. Culture. It's exactly, it gets even worse. It's like you, you know that if you hear a particular dialect, a particular thing, that you locate that culture at a particular place. Oh, Elma was saying geographically, you're like, oh, okay, we're in Cape Town now. So I got some of the words I must leave out. It's tuts, but it like those type of things. If I was in... <clears throat> yes. Oh, uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then you get to Durban and you say, Kear, can I say, excuse me? Because there's something, <laughs> something about the colonial project in Durban where colored people were literally used as a buffer between the Zulu and the and the uh, British colonial uh, troops. There's something about us we just can't seem to learn Afrikaans. There's, you know, and even if we do, my family has now come to reckon with the fact that Afrikaans that we speak is just what it's best. So yeah, there are different ways of being colored and, and language teaches us that, food teaches us that. And I think when we think about, we know we wrote the book, we say we wrote it for colored people, by colored people, but we ask for people to be compassionate. We ask for all peoples who are black to treat each other with compassion, because this has been my experience about the, color, about the Tyler episode, is that we have lectured each other, we have judged each other, we have called each other names, instead of being compassionate, instead of saying to you, I understand that there are different ways in that have, and different things that have shaped your experience and different ways of being. And so I hope that we'll just treat each other with a little bit more grace and a bit more curiosity also. Lindsay and Tessa, as you've seen, we've absolutely loved Coloured, how classification became culture. And this um, conversation has filled my heart. As I said, this book is a gift. It is a hug for my soul and my heart. It also is interesting to think about the ways in which Black people who grew up in places like the Northern Cape also exhibit a form of coloredness, right? But nobody wants to talk about that, right? Thank you for the book. Thank you for the conversation and thank you for the work that you do to lift us up. The book really epitomizes what Baldwin says, that the world is really held together by people who love it. And the two of you have really done that in this book. So from the bottom of our hearts, thank you very much. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Cheeky Natives. Don't forget to subscribe, review, and rate the podcast on all your streaming platforms.